Hi everyone and welcome back to the Mindful Teacher Parent Summit. My name is Corinne Winter and I'm so excited to have with me today my friend Nina uh, Srinivasan. She is an incredible teacher in the world of mindfulness and very respected in the, in the field of mindful education. Welcome Nina, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you so much, it's my pleasure. Before we get started um, on our conversation, I'd love to share a little bit about your bio and your work in the field of mindfulness and education. So buckle your seatbelt, everyone. This is a really incredible resume we have here. So Mina is a national board certified teacher and a South Asian American entrepreneur with deep experience in the fields of social and emotional learning and mindfulness and education. She's the founding executive director of transformational, transformative educational leadership known as TEL, an empowering rach, racially and culturally diverse, compassion-centered, innovative program for educators and leaders who are called to integrate mindfulness um, and stress reduction, social emotional learning, and academic and ethical learning into schools and into school cultures. Um, prior to this role, she spent five and a half years working in partnership with CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Social I was a collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning. Um, and they're the leaders in um, SEL in the US. She's taught in, in a variety of school settings, um, public, private, urban, and international, and holds a um, clear administrative services credential in the state of California. She is the author of Teach, Breathe, Learn, which I have and love this book, it's wonderful. It's called Teach, Breathe, Learn, Mindfulness in and Out of the Classroom as well as the book SEL, um, e I'm sorry, SEL Every Day, Integrating SEL with Instruction in Secondary Classrooms, which is um, middle and high school. She was also chosen as one of 2019's favorite books for educators by the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. And Nita's article, Social and Emotional Learning Starts with Adults, was one of AC, um, ASCD's 10 Best Expressed Articles in 2018. So, wow, you've really, um, talk about being an expert in one area in life. You, this is it. And um, I, I've spoken with a lot of people in the field of mindfulness um, over the past few weeks. And I have to say that Mina, um, the work that you're doing is so grounded in evidence and um, what the, the work that you're creating is really the work that teachers need and that school systems need to help move the needle in SEL, starting with the teachers and administrators first. So welcome to the summit. I'm so excited to have you. Mm, wonderful to be here with you. And hello to everyone out there um, who's joining us virtually. And uh, I just also want to say, you know, there are so many other places you could be right now, yet you chose to be here in this virtual space and prioritize mindfulness and social and emotional learning, which I really believe um, are the vehicle for creating a more compassionate and equitable world. So just thrilled to be a part of this and excited to be with you all and looking forward to our conversation, Karen. Thank you so much, Mina. Thank you. So, um, just if you can briefly just start us in a grounding practice before we go to the interview, something that you've practiced yourself or that you've shared with teachers. Sure. Well, I, you know, really want to situate our conversation and our current context of the unfolding of COVID-19, which has altered our lives as we know it. And if anything, um, really shown us how not in control we are. Uh, I, I have a two-year-old, so I have that experience of you're not in control <laughs> daily. Um, but this unfolding of COVID-19, I think, has really shown us all um, just how important mindfulness and social and emotional learning are. Uh, and also, it's lifted up our um, deep interconnectedness. And so the practice I'd like to offer is actually inspired um, by one of my teachers, Thich Nhat Hanh. And if it's okay with you, I want to just... Um, show a little quote from him to kind of ground us and then we'll move into the practice. So bear with me while I do a little screen share, folks. Yes, and we love Thich Nhat Hanh. He was my first teacher when I was um, just 16 years old, I was introduced to him. And um, I was uh, with my uncle, there you go. 
Um, and I studied his work as a teenager. Wow. Yeah. Well, we are, the world is a much better place because of his presence. And so, um, this quote, I'm going to, I'm going to read it slowly. I'm going to actually try and model, um, a contemplative practice called Lectio Divina, which means divine reading. And the idea behind Lectio Divina is to see the text as just a gift to be offered. And so if you'd like, you can close your eyes if you feel safe, but you don't have to. And so I'm going to read this quote slowly. And as I read, just let the words fall into your being and your body, uh, and then we'll move into a little practice. So Thich Nhat Hanh says, when the crowded Vietnamese refugee boats met with storms or pirates, if everyone panicked, all would be lost. But if even one person on the boat remained calm and centered, it was enough. It showed the way for everyone to survive. So starting to bring awareness to our breathing. And I invite you to really feel the sense of your feet rooted into the earth. And this calmness, this centeredness that Thich Nhat Hanh talks about is so needed in the world right now particularly as educators and educational leaders and as parents. So as you breathe in and out of your heart space consciously, rooting your feet into the earth, I'm going to invite you to bring to mind an ancestor, a land ancestor, a spiritual ancestor, or a blood ancestor, or really anyone that for you embodies resilience. And knowing that those who have come before us have gone through much more challenging times than we face now, and we can always draw on the strength of those who have come before, they live on through us and are in us. So really inviting this being's presence to be with you, to embrace you, to support you, all while touching into this rootedness. And just like a tree trunk, extends its roots into the earth and is sturdy even when the weather shifts and changes and the wind blows. Really touch into that rootedness, that centeredness, extending those roots, deepening those roots into the earth. And another quality that's so needed in the world right now is cultivating the capacity to hold both this rootedness with an open heart. So I'm going to invite you, as you're breathing in and out of your heart space, if you can, to extend your arms as you inhale and exhale. knowing that groundedness and compassion and the capacity to simultaneously hold this groundedness and compassion, this rootedness and open-heartedness is how we need to show up in this moment. It's how we need to meet this moment. So taking a few more conscious breaths, knowing that those who have come before are with us and we can always draw our strength from them. And if your hands are extended, you can gently bring them back and place them on your heart. 
Take one more deep breath in and out of your heart space as you root your feet into the earth and extend those roots. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes if they're closed. Mm -hmm. You know, Karen, I've been thinking a lot about how educators and educational leaders in particular and parents, now that I am a parent, um, how, we, how we have to hold space now. And for me, a large part of my practice has been the shift towards really cultivating this inner expansiveness, um, this inner expansiveness that can hold both the pain and the possibility of this moment. And I think about one of my teachers, a teacher in my spiritual community, Larry Ward, he talks about mindfulness um, as self-enhancement, as this way uh, for us to really enhance our nervous system so we can hold greater complexity. And I also love this quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, that if your cup is small, a little bit of salt will make the water salty. If your heart is small, then a little bit of pain can make you suffer. Your heart must be large. So really touching in and trying to cultivate this inner expansiveness, the visual of the spacious blue sky has been helpful for me. Um, and, you know, visualization meditations are also really helpful because our brain is a fan of visual stimuli. So I wanted to offer um, both of these quotes of wisdom from my teacher Thich Nhat Hanh and just invite us all to really cultivate this inner expansiveness and to touch into how we can have both rootedness and open-heartedness during this time. Mm. That's very powerful and beautiful. I love his teachings. He's such an incredible teacher and a beautiful soul and um, such wisdom that Thich Nhat Hanh um, offers. And um, if you don't know him, he's a, he's a Vietnamese monk who um, has been teaching for many, many years, nominated by um, Martin Luther King for the Nobel Peace Prize, among other awards. We actually honored him once at uh, Grace Cathedral. Yes, I remember. Yeah. Oh, Just huh. a year or so ago. And um, yeah, so he, if, if anyone's interested in his work, um, he has tons of books and resources as well. And Mina, you studied under him for a long time, right? Well, I, I uh, first met Thich Nhat Hanh uh, when I was living in India, and I'm a member of the Order of Interbeing. Um, which is uh, a community of, of dedicated practitioners in, in his particular lineage and tradition. Beautiful. Yeah, I love that. So um, I'm curious, what is your definition of mindfulness? How, would you def how do you define mindfulness? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked because it is certainly a term that is used so often these days. Um, but uh, for me, my definition has evolved. And, um, you know, one thing I would really like to do is to just start off with um, just a brief kind of land acknowledgement, because for me, um, mindfulness is really rooted in interdependence. So let me just get my slides back up here. And yeah, I, I think you're right about that. It is rooted in interdependence for sure. The sense of, of interdependence is so foundational. And, um, you know, I'm calling in from Richmond, California, which is the uh, traditional homeland of the Ohone peoples. And so um, maybe we can all just take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous stewards of the land that we call home that we're currently living on. And mm -hmm. um, if you don't know um, who the in indigenous stewards are, then just note that. Um, but I love this quote from this Ohone activist that there have always been indigenous peoples in the space we call home and there always will be. And I think about, um, you know, how I understand mindfulness is very much rooted in justice. And I think how we need to be sharing these practices have to have this sense of acknowledging the land. So how I define it is, bear with me, um, is paying attention to our inner and outer life as it unfolds while being grounded in our body, breathing, and senses so that our mind can settle and we can cultivate a curious, open-hearted presence 
and awareness of interbeing. And this is my son, Kai, who is now um, 25 months old. And there he is inviting the bell when he was 16 months old. And I want to just kind of briefly go through each of these points again. So this sense of really paying attention to both our inner and our outer life as it's unfolding in real time being grounded in our body and our breathing and our senses. So often we're like in our head, right? And we're not, we're not in our bodies. You know, I'd often say to my students, okay, our bodies are here, but where are our minds? And so this sense of really, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about, you know, if this is the mind and this is the body, when we engage in mindful breathing, our mind and body come together and we're established in the present moment. And the Chinese character um, for mindfulness is mind and present moment. But in a lot of Asian cultures, the word for mind is also the word for heart. So this quality of, of heartfulness. Um, settling our mind. I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with the glitter jar, which is a, um, a tool I use with my son and use when I was in the classroom. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, if you Google glitter jar, I'm sure you'll get a lot of great videos. But um, so often we're, we're shaken up and we're not thinking clearly. So the importance of really settling um, and uh, calming our nervous system so we can make better decisions. And then this quality of curiosity and open-heartedness is so important. This gentle inquiry, the stance of just openness and being curious to the unfolding that, uh, that's happening in our lives. And then finally, and for me most importantly, is awareness of inter- being. And I'm going to tell a little story just to share what I mean by interbeing. And when I was um, ages 26 to 31, I lived in my ancestral homeland of India. And I moved to India really to study contemplative practices. And it was um, there that I developed this really deep connection to um, my, my family in India, but in a way kind of reclaiming a lot of ancestral wisdom, knowledge. And when I was 28, my adopted city of New Delhi was the site of numerous bomb blasts that were fueled by tensions between Hindus and Muslims. And so I've had this experience of living in a very stressful, heightened state before. So um, while what's unfolding with COVID-19 is global, um, I have had this, this experience of living in a really heightened environment. And... Um, in the course of one month, there were five deadly attacks and our school was under lockdown. I was teaching at the American Embassy School at the time. Uh, and I was also doing work with um, Thich Nhat Hanh's nonprofit in India. His presence in India is an organization called Himsa Trust. And they do a lot of work with bringing mindfulness to, um, to teachers and leaders. Uh, but I was, you know, my practice wasn't as developed at that time, and I was really desperate for guidance on how to support my students. So um, after a long work day, um, even amidst sort of this tense environment of having these bomb blasts in the city, I attended a talk by a visiting peace activist on the anniversary of Gandhi's birth. And the talk was held at the site of his martyrdom and really lauded his commitment to nonviolent societal transformation. And that evening changed my life. Um, the speaker was Thich Nhat Hanh, and you had mentioned he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So here's a, a classic photo of, of both of them. And that night, Thich Nhat Hanh challenged us all to be Gandhi's continuation, and he introduced a term that's foundational to creating a beloved community, and that is foundational mindfulness, and that term is interbeing. So interbeing means to interdependently coexist. Interbeing honors the interdependence of every person to all other aspects of our planet. It's this shift in consciousness that comes with knowing in our body and our being that nothing exists independently. And a beautiful illustration of interbeing is uh, in Thich Nhat Hanh's writings where he says, if you were a poet, you would see clearly that there is a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. And without the cloud, there would be no rain. Without the rain, there would be no trees. And without the trees, there'd be no paper. The cloud is essential 
for the paper to exist. If the cloud is not there, the sheet of paper cannot be there either. And he goes on to say that if you look deeply enough, you can even see the logger who cut down the tree and the logger's ancestors as well in the sheet of paper. So interbeing is this real shift from, you know, looking at paper and uh, as, as an extraction, right? Or with forgetfulness. Um, and it's a shift to this interbeing consciousness where we really have this deep sense of the infinite causes and conditions that resulted in the paper being there and all of the non-paper elements that are part of the paper. And this is the same for like the orange I ate this morning, right? The soil, the sun, the farmers. Um, and it's something that I try my best to communicate with my son, he's two, so developmentally, I don't know how much he's getting right now, but you know, it's this sense of really moving in the world with a very different conscious consciousness. So, you know, the nonviolence that Gandhi and Dr. King practiced were rooted in this sense of interbeing. And Dr. King wrote, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And this is the interrelated structure of reality. And, you know, in the SEL world, we talk a lot about needing to connect, but the truth is we're already connected. But if we can shift our sense of self from this strongly individuated separate identity to a connected collective identity, then we'll really view our world, our nation, and the work we're doing in schools with fresh eyes. And so this requires a major paradigm shift and a shift where we attune to this intelligence of interbeing. And I think COVID-19 is really lifting up just how interconnected we are and how our, all of our actions have an impact. And so it's a beautiful time to practice mindfulness in this particular way. So for me, Karen, mindfulness must be engaged. You know, once they're seeing, there has to be acting. Otherwise, what's the use of seeing is another wonderful quote from Thich Nhat Hanh that I hold front and center. Um, and for folks that may not be familiar with this book by David Forbes, um, I encourage you to check it out. And in it, he really talks about um, what he he coins emergent mindfulness, um, but the sense of personal mindfulness is step one, but mindful social action is step two and all are inseparable. So for me, um, justice is central to how we think about mindfulness and interbeing is really the foundation. I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah, that is just so wonderfully said. I, th I think that we try teaching interdependence to the kids and we do in our, our lesson on altruism, which is the last lesson, because we feel like we first need to get, have them focus on themselves and then learn about compassion in their interdependent relationships with other people one-on-one -on -one, um, in more like a didactic relationship and in small groups and stuff like that. But then when we teach them about altruism, we talk about interdependence and seeing the interbeingness of the paper and the cloud and the water and the trees and having it drawn out like that is really, really, it simplifies it in such a beautiful way um, to help us recognize how truly we connect, connected we are. And I really loved how you pulled that back into COVID-19, how it's becoming apparent to us, whether we practice mindfulness or not, whether we're a, a practitioner of consciousness or whatever our philosophy is, it's unavoidable to recognize or not our fragility and our interconnectedness and the in ripple effect that we all have on one another and the ripple effects that our actions have on one another. And there is an intelligence of interbeing um, and there is some intelligence in what's happening today. Um, with the emergence of social action, um, that's really, really important. Um, if you look at a lot of the spiritual truths around the world through whether it's religion or philosophy or, or va a value-based philosophy, let's say, um, they teach social action usually as like the final step in personal development. Um, they teach it in the 12 steps, like in Alcoholics Anonymous, they teach it like you heal yourself, you become present, you forgive people, you love people, and then you serve, you know? Um, and I think so many great leaders in our world talked about social action. Um, after teaching yoga for so many years, I got, I was like, what, enough with these asanas. Like we have to get off our asana and into the world 
and, and start to be of service to humanity. And I think that if we don't intertwine mindfulness with service, we're, we're in a way missing the mark because all of our consciousness is, is, is wonderful and beautiful. But if we just sit, you know, in Lotus position on a mountain somewhere, we're not really helping the world so much, you know, but if we can take all of that and apply it into our communities, into our families, into these small acts of kindness, that's what's really going to shift the needle in our planet. And um, I especially just want to lastly say, I love how you acknowledge our ancestors um, and, and how you honored the land of the people that came before us, um, the land that we took, most of us, right? And, and, um, and to just honor that interdependence that we all have. And I think that that simple acknowledgement of our interdependence in some capacity helps alleviate some of our judgments towards one another. It just, it, on some level, and maybe you can talk more about that, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, first of all, in places like New Zealand or Canada, they begin all meetings and even sporting events with a land acknowledgement, and it certainly doesn't repair the harm of the past, but um, it's a different way of orienting oneself and really acknowledging, um, you know, who, who the original stewards of the land that, that has been stolen, um, who they are. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. So um, you talk a lot about um, empowerment and racial and cultural diversity and innovative approaches um, to help healing our, our culture in a sense. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I I'm, well, but... <laughs> I'm going off the script here. I'm sorry, but well, you know, we have enough talk around that on our summit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the um... equity and mindfulness and things like that. For sure. Well, one thing I want to just really mention is that for me, mindfulness and social and emotional learning are in service of belonging. And that you had mentioned, you know, we, about how folks are like doing the asanas. And if you really, you know, study the original text, it's like asana is supposed to prepare you, right, for sitting practice. <laughs> It's, but of course, in the United States, we're obsessed with the body. You know, it's gone in a, in a total other direction. But let's parking lot that. I have a whole other conversation around around the commercialization of yoga in the U.S. But um, we have to ask ourselves, what is this in service of? And for me, which is you know why I so clearly always state mindfulness and SEL in service of belonging. And I use the word belonging very deliberately because you can't talk about belonging if you don't talk about power. Right? right? And belonging is much deeper than inclusion, right? Inclusion is like, all right, you can, you can come into what we've created, but we're not going to really shift the power structures here. So I think what's happening, and even if we, I was just reading an article this morning, like who's being impacted by COVID-19, right? It's more vulnerable populations who are primarily a lot of communities of color. And so we have to do some deep looking at the legacies of racism and historical injustices and what is still happening in our country. Um, I talk about this a lot more in, um, in an online course I have launching where we really talk about um, social and emotional learning and service of equity and service of belonging. And a lot of it has to do with our own beliefs and the inner work that we all have to do, not just folks of the dominant culture, but I think in right. particular folks who are of the dominant culture, um, you know, there's a lot of deep looking and deep work that has to happen. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And recognition of our privilege and, and all of those things, I think, help contribute um, to mindfulness practice. Like, it's silly to have mindfulness and SEL without addressing race and equanimity and equality. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for many years, right, SEL was seen as race and culture neutral, which nothing's race and culture neutral, no. right? And so there's been a movement um, to really ensure that social emotional learning is identity affirming. Um, and, and for me, uh, there, there's just so much work that has to be done, but um, the inner work is key to actually result in that kind of outer transformation because otherwise um you know if we don't move through the pain that inevitably comes up the transformation doesn't happen so um i think that we're in for some big shifts um 
uh, globally uh, and locally. And I think it's all for the better and that we really need to seize this, um, this turning point for all of us to truly create a more compassionate and equitable world. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of COVID-19 in the world, and there's a lot of people out there today that are really stressed and they're um, looking for practices to help them regulate their emotions and their feelings. Do you have a, a practice in particular that you want to share with us um, now that could help people connect to their hearts or um, just find some inner peace during this time? Sure. sure. Well, you know, I, I talk about the, you know, mindfulness must be engaged and I talk, you know, and then I talk about the systemic issues a lot, but I have folks who are like, Nina, I am stressed out. Give me some self-care strategy. So, you know, just like they say on the plane, we got to put our oxygen mask on first. So I actually have a couple of strategies, Karen, and um, I'm going to do a little screen share in a moment. Let me just see here. Um, Yeah, there's a couple that I'd love to share that um, have been really helpful for me. So I'm speaking kind of from personal experience of someone who's managing a beyond full-time job as a two-year-old at home. Um, yeah, I guess that having a two-year-old in a sense forces you to be mindful and patient. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, present moment. totally. And I think there's also just the reality that a lot of things like grocery shopping, it takes more time, more mindfulness, you know, yeah. disinfecting. I mean, all these things, can we bring, can we, um, can we reframe? And I'm going to talk a little more about the reframe. So number one, resource yourself first right? So um, I ask myself, what's one essential thing I need to do for my well-being daily? And folks, you got to calendar this. You got to schedule it in. What is your one thing? And if you have capacity to do more than one thing, that's awesome. You certainly don't have my life context right now. Um, You know, I I, I was watching something a few weeks ago where um, a well-known mindfulness teacher was like, this is an invitation for self-retreat. And I'm like, you don't have a (laughs) two-year-old. So... Um, it's a different kind of retreat, uh, but find that one thing, whether it's meditating, whether it's exercising, whether it's making a delicious home cooked meal, um, what is the one thing you need for your well being daily and do that religiously? Now, the second thing I'd like to talk about, hold on, slides, is um, if you don't already know of this resource, the Tree of Contemplative Practices from the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society, check it out. Um, I think sometimes people think that they just, they got to do sitting meditation. And um, I really subscribe to a wider variety of contemplative practices. And I love this image because the roots signify the two intentions of contemplative practice, communion and connection and awareness. So there's many ways we can resource ourselves and cultivate open-heartedness and insight during this time. So I really encourage you to um, check this resource out. Um, You don't just have to sit and do like a 30 minute sitting meditation. There's so many different ways that you can be engaging in contemplative practices. And then the next thing I'd like to share is, the smart, the practice of short moments of awareness repeated many times or smart breaks. Uh, and again, as a, as a mother with a small child who used to have these luxurious meditations in the morning, but uh, haven't had the time really since he was born to sit in the way I used to, I am so grateful for my smart breaks throughout the day and I do them with my son and they can be just these micro practices. Um, It could be just really attuning to, um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the five senses practice in any moment, you know, engage your five senses in what you're doing when you're brushing your teeth, really tasting, you know, what does a toothpaste taste like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like when you're, when you're brushing your teeth? But just these short moments, um, you could also, you know, set a timer on your phone. Um, but, but really the, the smart practice has been very, very helpful, um, for a lot of busy parents I know. And then touch, savor, and soak in your joy. Um, you know, David Hawkins wrote this book, Power Versus Force, where he had this great consciousness scale. Um, you may be familiar with it. Some of you that are watching this might be. But joy is one of the highest vibrational um, feeling states that we can have. And so I encourage you, whenever you experience a moment of joy, to touch it, 
touch it deeply, savor and soak it in for as long as you can. So it could be, you know, for me, it's whenever I get to go ride my bicycle around where I live, feeling the wind on my face, Mm -hmm. smelling the air, just soaking it, hugging my son, you know, just soaking it in. Um, And you also may be noticing now that there are things you don't have access to that bring you a lot of joy that you don't have access to. And that in and of itself, that noticing can be a beautiful practice. My husband is a basketball fanatic. He loves the NBA and the fact that they're not in season right now is crushing him. But he was sharing with me, like, I didn't realize how much joy I got from watching basketball. Mm -hmm. So notice that. And then, you know, when the season's back, I'm sure he's going to really Um, touch into that more, just how important it is in his life is something that brings him joy. Another thing I want to mention is practicing the reframe. Um, So I mentioned this briefly earlier, but one uh, one of the ways I like to practice the reframe is instead of saying, I have to, I get to, I think in particular, those of us that are home with our kids trying to juggle work and Um, And I'm not saying it's not easy. I mean, it's hard. Um, But instead of saying, I have to watch my son, it's like, I get to. He's usually in preschool for eight hours a day, but I get to be with him now. So really, you know, practicing that reframe. Um, Another reframe that I really love, and um, I believe you know Brother Fap Hai, who is in the the Thich Nhat Hanh community, who's just such a a beautiful teacher. Um, I was listening to a talk of his a few weeks ago, and he was talking about shifting the question of what is the meaning of all this to how can I bring meaning to this moment? Mm. So that's another way we can reframe. It's like, how can I bring meaning? this moment to each moment. And then I love this from Danielle Laporte, this whole reframe on COVID. So we're not socially distancing, right, Karen? We're socially connected now, we're connecting now, but we're just, we're physical distancing. Right. <laughs> we're not quarantining or locking down. We're retreating for wellness. And just pay attention. How does it land in your body when you say quarantining versus retreating for wellness? Totally different, right? We're not isolating. We're protecting our health. We're not in fear. We're in choice. We're doing this for the highest good of all, right? So uh, finally, um, make self-compassion central. Uh, This is a public service announcement that I saw on Facebook. Um, You know, those of us that are parents, uh, what we're being asked to do is not humanly possible, um, right? Teaching, parenting, Uh, and working all at the same time. So one of the ways I love to practice self-compassion is just, this is a hard moment. And what would a friend say to myself right now? So um, there's also, oh, the practice of watering seeds. Um, This is a a very important practice in the Plum Village community. So we all have seeds, helpful seeds and unhelpful seeds inside of us. And mindfulness enables us to uh, be more aware of what seeds we're watering. So just, you know, are we watering seeds of fear or are we watering seeds seeds of hope? You know, right now, Um, When we think about the spectrum of possibilities in the future, uh, on one end is hope, right? And how we meet this present moment or envision the future. One end's hope and the other's despair. And hope is really important because especially those of us who are parents or educators or leaders, if we aren't transmitting this hopefulness, um, instead we we are transmitting this defeating energy. And so I like to think a lot about active hope, which isn't, um, it isn't trying to make our situation different, but instead it's really, and Joanna Macy talks a lot about this, it's um, getting clear on what your vision is and then what role you want to play in making that vision a reality. So I ask all of us at this trying time, you know, what's your vision? How do you want the world to change and what's your role? Um, and I want to thank you, Karen, for putting this summit together because mm-hmm. you really stepped up in creating something and offering for the world right now um, that I think is definitely going to be useful. Uh, And then um, I think we can skip through, oh, that was the consciousness that I was mentioning before. I think we can just stop right there for now. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Wow, I love that active hope, creating a vision for the reality we want to live in. That's just uh, really an intriguing and interesting way to think of hope you know, rather than just 
wanting for it to occur in our lives or come to us and wishing for something. It's like getting active and creating. It's not relying on an external. Right? Yeah, not relying. It's just like, it's a collaboration. Hope is a collaboration that requires action. And I like, I love the practice of the reframing. I think the reframing our perspective of where we're at now with COVID is really important and seeing this, oh, this is a retreat, you know, for some of us, it doesn't feel like a retreat at all, but this is an, <laughs> right? this is an opportunity. And, and the reframe is so important and we could do it a thousand times a day, you know, and parents do need to resource themselves first and um, whenever they can do it, whether it's when they, if they go to the bath, maybe they just pretend they're going to the bathroom <laughs> and have their partner watch their baby for a moment, right? And just, or, or just brushing their teeth or washing the dishes or whatever it may be. I was kidding, but, but you know, whatever it may be to help us cultivate that moment of peace because all we really have are moments. And one, one quote I like to say is all time is my time, no matter who I'm with or who I'm serving or what I'm doing, it's still my time. It still belongs to me. And we can be present with whatever it is that we're doing, even if we're multitasking, you know, we can breathe through the multitask mania <laughs> that everyone's experiencing. So what a wonderful talk. What an incredible opportunity we had to, to connect with you. I want to learn more a little bit before we start to close about your SEL Everyday um, online course that you're launching, because I'm, I'm interested in it for, for myself, for our teachers and everyone out there. Sure. Um, well, I do want to share one other thing, oh, which sure. some Sorry. folks may have seen. Um, hold on. We love you, Joanna, but we're going we're gonna to move. There's the beloved Joanna Macy. Um, so this, there was this graphic that was on Facebook that I just loved and we, um, we kind of redid it. And there, it's who do I want to be during COVID-19? So there's the fear zone, there's the learning zone, and then there's the growth zone. And so I encourage folks to just even hold this question of who do you want to be in this unfolding and how can you be in that growth zone because we need as many people as possible in that growth zone. And um, the course that I have coming up, oh, this is also a free resource, uh, Integrating Mindfulness into Virtual Professional Learning Spaces. If you go to my website, you can get a hold of it. But Karen, you can also send this out to folks that are watching the summit. Um, but this is the course. So it's uh, Cultivating Mindfulness in SEL and Service of Belonging. And it opens on April 23rd. And I'll be offering um, a discount in response to these unprecedented times of uncertainty and upheaval. So be offering a significant discount until May 8th. And there are two paths you can take. So there's actually two different courses. There's a course for educators, so folks who might have more of a classroom practice, and then there's a course for leaders. Um, and the, the course for me is really centered on kind of what I was talking about before, that mindfulness and SEL has to be centered in belonging, but rooted in interbeing. And there are... Um, there are a number of different modules and um, you can send out more information for folks. Uh, but this is just a visual kind of sense-making graphic I've put together um, that, that really lifts up what I feel this is ultimately all about, which is liberation. Um, not just individual liberation, but collective liberation and not just liberation in the relative sense of being free. But for me, it's um, free from the illusion of my separateness from you, right? The Technon says we're here to wake up from our illusion of separateness. And so um, this is really kind of a, a core concept uh, in the course. And uh, there's, Lila Watson, I'm trying to get to another thing about the course. <laughs> Hold on. One of the things we also go over is, so it's, I also provide a lot of practical tools. And so I have this building your SEL house analogy, which goes through these different steps of how you actually implement social and emotional learning, but mindfulness-based social emotional learning that is really centered in justice. And, um, the educator course is four modules and it's 15 lessons. It's about 8.5 hours of video lesson content. And the leader course is six modules, 21 lessons, and it's about 12 hours of video lesson content. And that's not including all of the reflection exercises. And, you know, for me, Karen, I'm going to take, take the screen share off. I, um, I was called to create this course, um, 
believe me, it's not like I wanted to add another thing on my plate, but I think like you, I know you got the, um, the vision for this summit through your meditation. And I was really called to create something accessible. And while the bulk of the course was developed during the months before COVID really came on the global scene, um, I think my intuition knew something was happening and I needed to provide a practical resource out there for folks. And um, something that was really going to support this this seismic shift that I think not, now has to happen in the world. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I I'm hopeful that it will be a useful resource for folks out there, and just really enjoyed this time to connect with you, and look forward to when we get to connect again, hopefully in person. Hopefully in person, yes, that would be wonderful. Well, the course looks amazing. Your work's incredible. It's revolutionary and it's much, it's very much needed in our world today and especially in our schools. And I'm sure there's tons of teachers and leaders out there that are excited to learn more. Um, Mina, you also wrote this incredible book, Teach, Breathe, Learn, which I have and I, I, I love this book. You can buy that on Amazon, right? As well as your other book. Social and emotional, the other. Yeah, and SEL if you book. enroll in the course, you get a 20% discount actually on both the books. So the SEL Every Day and Teach, Breathe, Learn. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, well, before we end, would you mind closing us with a short practice? Sure, sure. Well, I'm getting um, with while you're practicing. Yeah, why don't we get comfortable, folks? All right. We're going to just do a short practice of three collective breaths. If it's helpful, you can place your hand on your heart. And with the first breath, I'd like for you to honor yourself for showing up and for being here in this virtual space. So breathing in and out of your heart, sending that sense of gratitude to yourself. And we'll take a second breath, inhaling and exhaling through our heart space, just honoring those who are on this journey with us. And you may have be watching this by yourself, but you are connected to a large community of individuals that are committed to this work of mindfulness and social and emotional learning in service of belonging. And then with our third breath, let us hold in our hearts the next generation. In, a, in my spiritual community, we talk about practicing so a future can be possible. And if you're a parent and you have a child, really bring them into your mind and heart's eye right now. And if your eyes are closed, you can gently open them. I want to thank all of you for being here. I wish you well, Karen. I wish you well. Giving you a virtual hug. You're virtual in California. Hug. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us and joining the uh, Mindful Parent Teacher Summit. And if you um, signed in late today, we have with us Mina Shrini Vasan. She is the founder of um, the author, excuse me, of Mindfulness. Um, I'm sorry, I, I lost my spot here. Teach, breathe, learn and Everyday Mindfulness, SEL Every Day, Integrating SEL with Instruction in Secondary Classrooms. And you can find more information on her website. I'm gonna spell out, you wanna spell out your website for me? You can probably do it faster than I can. Sure, it's just my name. It's M-E-E-N-A-S-R-I-N-I-V-A-S-A-N.com. I think if you Google Mina Mindfulness, I'll probably come up. Probably, great, awesome. So minasirivasan.com. So thank you again for joining us, everyone. Have a safe day. Have a healthy and happy day. And we are with you in spirit. Thank you.